In the next section, I'd like to talk about grounded theory. Now, grounded theory is something that is quite academic, and it is quite academic and quite common in the social sciences. And um, as we'll see, um, it means that, I guess, for designers, you're probably only going to do part of it in a fairly light way uh, most of the time. So grounded theory, um, to explain it, the different the thing that they co contrast it with is grand theory. So suppose, um, you know, grand theory was academics in ivory towers sitting back pontificating about, well, I think this such and such occurs and therefore this, 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 this. And the next one goes, well, this, da, 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 da. but it's um, and all quite kind of theory coming down. Grounded theory is the idea of, well, OK, let's have a look at the data and let's have a process for analysing this data and producing theory straight from our data. And it's a um, it's a process that has a number of steps. The, the, the first step in it is the sort of coding uh, that we've talked about so far. You've got maybe a transcript, and that's kind of what I've shown in the diagram here. And we've marked particular parts of it as being about particular things or as being particular kinds of events or um, well, whatever we've decided our, our codes are. And I could, I suppose you could say that this is open coding because the set of codes is somewhat open-ended. At this point, we might be reading the data and um, if we're afresh to it, we don't necessarily have the codes to start with. We're discovering what are the common things that people talk about. And every now and then go, oh, I think I should code that. I don't already have a code for that. I'm going to add one for that one. And then going back in the transcript and going, oh, yep, that was that too. And yep, that one was that one as well. And and so we're, we're producing codes as we go. There's a couple of different kinds of codes. In vivo codes basically means that you're taking the wording from the participant. That chunk of text, I've seen that occurred before. I'm going to code that as a, uh, in in this particular way. Later on you see something similar or that looks like it's equivalent and you kind of just use that text that came from one of your participants as the code. Uh, constructed codes um, really means it comes from the researcher or maybe it comes from theory stuff that you'd kind of got had a preconception of what was going to be happening and you think oh there it is there it is happening and, and, and you give it that particular code. And so this is the first stage is just going through and coding everything, coming up with all of the tags. The second stage is called axial coding. And this is essentially about identifying the relationships between the codes that came out of the, out of the open coding. And um, generally speaking in grounded theory, um, it, it has a kind of a bit of a basis for it. And it tries to prioritize this idea that maybe there are causal relationships between codes and so maybe they fall into particular kinds of groups so um, generally the idea is is that there is some phenomenon that you're looking into uh, you're looking into this particular kind of situation maybe it's um, you know uh, people getting frustrated with their work or, or, or whatever the whatever the phenomenon is well that phenomenon it has it happens in some kind of a context and there's certain kinds of conditions that cause that phenomenon to occur. And then, once the phenomenon's occurred, well, people are going to take some kind of action. But, well, actually, the actions they can take are going to depend on the situation that they're in. So if you can imagine, uh, if you discover that something's happened and you need to take action about it, the action that you can take might might change depending on whether well, you've heard about it through an email and you're sitting on the train or if you're in the room in the office and there's people around you that you can interact with. Um, so the, the, the first set of uh, conditions are the conditions um, that cause the phenomenon to occur. The second, the intervening conditions, are the conditions that drive what the actions someone can take are. And then those actions are going to have some kind of consequences. And so you may end up getting, um, if you like, groups of codes that are grouped around these particular categories. Here's the conditions. Here's the context ones. Here's the phenomenon. Uh, here's the uh, intervening conditions that direct what people can do. Here's what people actually did. And here's what the consequences of those actions were. The third stage in grounded theory is what they call selective coding. And this is the point at which the researcher sits there and goes, hmm, what's the real story here? What's really going on? What, what, what is the heart of this particular issue? 
And so the, the idea is that, that eventually some of this stuff is going to be, if you like, more central, more salient, more key than the rest of it and that you want to make that the center of your story and so maybe it is about maybe it's about the conditions maybe it's about what under what conditions this particular phenomena happens or maybe it's about how uh, maybe it's about the, the the intervening conditions maybe it's about how users strategize for for what they can do about the situation but so th this kind of depends on the story that you're trying to tell uh, about this phenomenon about the situation and so that that is, I guess, a little bit about what's happening, but it's also a little bit about the target of your research. Advice I've heard is that this can be difficult to decide. You can be sitting there thinking, well, I think these 10 things are core. Or you might just be sitting there thinking, oh, my goodness, I've got no idea. And having the 10 things is probably an easier situation than having none because you can make a decision rather than having to having to work it out. Um, but nonetheless, because uh, we're not going to do a grounded theory exercise in this course. Uh, so I, I'm just at this point going to, if you like, describe it. And then later on, perhaps if you're doing some research and maybe you'll need to find yourself doing some grounded theory. Um, the next step in it is what they call comparative analysis. And this is this idea that... Uh, well, in our selective coding, when we started relating what was the core of it and then how do all the different tags relate to each other, we've started to build up some kind of a theory about what's going on and that maybe the next step we should do is go back to the data. Uh, how, now, now that we've got our model, go back to the data, go back and have a look at, well, when those things did occur, um, and it occurred in this case here and in that case there, uh, and comparing them and understanding them in the context of our model, but also trying to look at all sorts of different aspects around it. You know, perhaps the um, the, the the social aspects, the constraints, uh, all kind of m many different layers that we might want to have a look at. But now that we've now that we've got not just the codes, but the relationships between the codes and what we think are the centrally important codes, uh, we can go into a bit more thoughtful detail in comparing what has happened in the events that we've witnessed. Um, and yeah, the, the, this idea of comparing across many d dimensions. The last step of this, um, I've seen in some descriptions of grounded theory anyway that I was looking into uh, before preparing this video, uh, they call theory building. And this is the idea that, well, OK, we built up our understanding, our generated theory based off what was happening, what we observed to be happening in the data. Uh, but now we'd like to integrate that with existing theory in the domain. Uh, how does this relate to what other researchers have done, what other people have looked into, other studies that have happened? And so I've put kind of these grey dot, dot, dots here where you come, kind of might say, well, this stuff around the context, I think these researchers and those studies about this kind of show what's going on and we can see those the, 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 this particular uh, process that Spoodle and Blogs identified happening here, etc. Now, what I'd suggest is that this is where things can seem to get rather academic. So far, what we've talked about here, from, from the coding, tagging what's happening, to understanding how those tags relate to each other, uh, to thinking about what the core of it is the matter, uh, to comparing the uh, events in particular scenarios. Uh, all of that is about the researcher or the designer and the data. Suddenly in theory building, we pick up the whole weight of academic literature and do you know the relevant theory and all those sorts of questions. And so I suspect that it is this last step that you are probably not going to want to do as a designer. You're probably going to want to do the first few steps if you're designing a technology. Yes, I can see the value of coding. Yes, I can certainly see the value of trying to relate your codes to each other. Yes, I can certainly see the value of trying to understand what's at the core of it. But unless you're actually publishing a research paper, relating it to Spoodle's theory and Bloggs' theory uh, might be a little bit dry, a little bit academic. And um, this is where it, I guess it also ties into some, some things kind of about my, my background. My, 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 my father was a professor of mechatronics and he's a very, very smart chap. Um, but he's also a very grounded chap. I, I mean, his father was a toolmaker, a very smart chap, but someone who, you know, did making things in a factory. 
um, and making tools in a factory for other people to make things in a factory. The, 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 the kind of the, the king of the trades, as it were. Um, one of the quotes that my father, professor of robotics, particularly liked was from William Hazlitt. And it's where he talks about learning is the knowledge that, uh, of that which none but the learned know. The learned man does not know whether his oldest acquaintance is a knave or a fool, but he can pronounce a pompous lecture on all the principal characters in history. Um, so this is kind of, if you like, a, a rhetorical um, complaint that we often talk about learning and knowledge, talking about the things that only smart academics in universities understand and not talking about the everyday experience of people working in the domain or the everyday experience of the users. And so where in the first few steps we were talking about the everyday experiences of the users and modeling those and understanding those, suddenly in the theory building step, we've picked some stuff up that, well, the, the, the people in the, uh, in the context, the users, etc., will almost certainly never have heard of. Um, and so that's kind of where I start feeling ooh, a little bit nervous that uh, we're becoming uh, a little bit too, a little bit dry and academic, a little bit too, uh, if you like, inwards focused, talking about what each other has done rather than specifically about what the, the user groups have done. Um, this is if you're working as a designer just trying to build technology. If you're if you're publishing academic research papers, then it is an ex there is an expectation that you've kind of read in your field and that you understand and correlate to the work of other researchers. Um, but so anyway, for a designer, I kind of have the, the rule of thumb that no one should be able to respond to you, ah, but have you read Foucault and Vygotsky? Um, so what I mean by this is that if you're doing something like grounded theory, even though it comes from academia, um, I think it is still something that you can apply as a designer because you can just relate it to the theory, the stuff that you know, the stuff that you have come across, and maybe even you haven't particularly come across uh, uh, formal theories from the literature. Maybe you've only come across things informally. But don't panic about the theory that you haven't read. Don't panic about, am I doing this properly? Uh, because the stuff you don't know, the stuff you haven't read, is always an unbounded set. There's more stuff you haven't read coming out all of the time. Uh, don't feel as though you're an imposter unless you've been across everything, uh, because most of the time you are a, a designer. You're trying to find things out about the technology that you want to build. You are not doing academic publishing. So you're kind of exactly the reverse of Paul Durish's implications for design paper. There he was saying, well, ethnography has... Uh, an importance, an academic importance of its own right. It doesn't all have to be about implications for design. If you're a designer designing technology, well, you care about the implications for design. You don't necessarily care about the academic side of ethnography. Um, coming back to the memos. Um, so even in grounded theory, uh, the advice is to write up your ideas about the codes and their relationships and to do this at any time. Data is persistent, ideas are fragile. So the informal stuff that you do as a designer where you're just looking at things and you're just going, ooh, that seems important, I'm going to write that on a sticky note, um, that is actually proper stuff to be doing. Um, eventually, quite a lot of the information we get from talking to our users is going to turn up as little sticky note observations. The next part I'd like to talk about